okay hello all the students yesterday i had explained to you a brief idea about the unification of physics starting with how newton unified the falling of the apple to the ground with the motion of planets around the sun so that unified the inverse square law of gravitation so that is it, show, it showed that the same inverse law of gravitation was responsible that is responsible for making the apple fall down is same as that responsible for holding the planets in an orbit around the sun then the next unification came when maxwell unified electricity and magnetism with light and he derived the wave equation for by deriving the wave equation for the electric and magnetic fields and showing that the velocity of these waves comes out to be the speed of light when you calculate by substituting the values of the perme permittivity and the permeability the next major unification came when einstein uh, when uh, einstein planck when planck, max planck einstein edwin schrodinger werner heisenberg and dirac they created quantum mechanics and uh, uh, it was not a unification it was a new theory of micro of uh, quantum particle particles on the quantum scale that is on the angstrom scale showing that non commutative non commutative calculus is required to describe the dynamics of uh, dynamics on a very small scale the major unification came when einstein showed that if maxwell's equations are to remain invariant in all inertial frames then you cannot go for the galilean transformation defined by newton but you must rather adopt the lorentz transformation of coordinate that because and he said that the light speed of light should be a constant that was one of the postulates of the special theory of relativity for the simple reason that if you are standing with a as einstein gave this example if you are standing with a mirror in front of you and you move at the speed of light then if you use the galilean law of addition of velocities your image should suddenly disappear from the screen and that cannot happen that means the laws of physics won't be valid at speed when the speed of the rocket goes near approaches the speed of light and you are sitting with a rocket with a mirror held in front of you so einstein discovered the special theory of relativity in which electromagnetism remains in way the laws of electromagnetism remain invariant under all inertial frame transformations whereas the laws of newton they change from one to one frame to the other so newton's laws of mechanics cannot possibly be valid if one has to admit covariance of the laws of motion under inertial frame transformations the next major step came when einstein created the general theory of relativity relativity in which he in which he showed that he stated that the gravitational field is not a force field it is rather a curvature of space time and when particles move in this on this curved manifold what we call accelerated motion is actually the motion of orbit of particle motion of particles along geodesics that is straight lines but on a curved surface space time manifold surface so this is the process then after that feynman schwinger and tomonaga they created the quantum theory of fields and dyson also dyson feynman schwinger and tomonaga they created the quantum theory of fields in which uh, they were able to describe the interactions between electrons positrons and photons in a very concise way and it gave a new picture in the sense that these amplitude these scattering amplitudes could be calculated using the laws of quantum mechanics using uh, 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 using uh, and using the path integral feynman's path integral feynman also created the path integral uh, path created the path integral for, for he di he discovered a new way to formulate quantum mechanics namely in terms of path integrals and he showed that it is completely equivalent to the operator theoretic formulation of schrodinger heisenberg and dirac so today what we will do is we will look at one small problem in electromagnetism which is very important it is called the problem of dielectric resonator antennas dielectric resonator antennas so what you do here is you have a box the side of the box the side lengths of the box are a b c along the coordinate axis a b and d along the coordinate axis and within this an electromagnetic field is oscillating so the conduct the, the boundaries of this box are perfect conductors so what are the boundary conditions of the maxwell equation the maxwell equations imply boundary conditions namely that on any surface if you take any surface and suppose on one side of the surface the electric field and magnetic field are e and h e1 and h1 and on the other side they are e2 and h2 then the tangential component of the electric field should be continuous the discontinuity in the tangential component of the magnetic field should equal the surface current density the normal component component of the displacement namely epsilon e1 and epsilon 2 e2 
the normal component of the displacement uh, vector, electric displacement vector that should have a discontinuity equal to the free surface, free, free surface charge density on the surface and the normal component of the magnetic field which is mu 1 h 1 on one side and mu 2 h 2 on, on the other side. This normal component should have a discontinuity, it should not have a discontinuity at all, it should be continuous. These boundary conditions one can deduce from the Maxwell equations by converting them into integral form and then taking a loop for example, a loop which covers, which passes, which is of length L, which goes over the surface and comes down, cuts into the surface, goes from this end to this end and you allow the width of this loop to shrink to 0 and then apply the uh, for example, if you want, if you take the, if you take max, if you take Campier's law in the form del cross h is equal to j plus dou d by dou t, then this will imply that the integral of h, line integral of h around the loop gamma is equal to the flux of j. This is the conduction current and the displacement current dot and ds over the surface. And as the width of the loop shrinks to 0, this surface shrinks to 0, so this will go to 0 and this will imply that the tangential component of h is continuous across the boundary. Likewise, Faraday's law of induction curl of E is equal to minus mu dou h by dou t or you can write it as minus dou v by dou t. When you write it in integral form, it will imply that the line integral of E around the loop E dot dl equals minus integral dou v by dou t dot and ds, the flux of the magnetic field through the surface. Again, as the loop shrinks to 0, this contribution becomes 0 and this will become equal to E1, the tangential component of the electric field on this side times the length of the loop on this side minus the tangential component of the electric field on this side times the length of the loop on this side. So, I hope you are able to understand all these ideas. We want to apply these concepts to derive the modes of vibration of the electromagnetic field within the cavity and for that, we need to do some work. So, we write down the, uh, where is the duster? Okay, we write down the Maxwell equations which are relevant here, del cross E in the frequency domain minus j omega mu h and curl of h is equal to j omega epsilon E in the frequency domain. In the frequency domain, the operator dou by dou t gets replaced by multiplication by j omega because signals which vary at frequency omega have a dependence of E power j omega t and if you take the derivative with respect to time it will become j omega e for j omega t. So, it is equivalent to multiplying by j omega. So, these are the Maxwell equations. This is always true, this is Faraday's law of induction, whereas this is true only when uh, the conductivity is 0, that is you put sigma as 0 within the conductor and uh, you and you assume that there is no current density within the conductor. So, this is Ampere's law with the displacement correction, displacement current correction term. In case the conductivity is also taken into account, this will be replaced by sigma plus j omega epsilon times e, where sigma is the conductivity. The reason is very simple, the, the total current is the sum of the conduction current, the displacement current, these two terms and maybe another current due to magnetization, you can call it as Jm, this is due to magnetic dipoles. So, Jc by Ohm's law is given by is proportional to the electric field whereas, J d according to Maxwell is given by J omega epsilon e namely the rate of change of the electric field with time. So, we look at Maxwell's equations within the resonator cavity curl of E is minus J omega mu h and curl of h is equal to sigma plus J omega epsilon e in the case that there is a conduction current. The general equation which we start which we start with is the generalization Maxwell generalization of Ampere's law namely this is equal to the j, j conduction current plus the displacement current plus the magnetization current where j c by Ohm's law is given by sigma e it is proportional to the electric field sigma is the conductivity of the medium j d is equal to dou epsilon by dou t multiplied by epsilon this is needed in order to maintain the equation of continuity because if you take a divergence on both sides, divergence of a curl is 0. So, divergence of curl h is 0. So, that will imply that divergence of j d, j d plus j c is 0, which will imply that divergence of j, divergence of j d or divergence of j c 
is equal to minus divergence of JD and that is equal to minus divergence of epsilon dou E by dou T and you can interchange spatial divergence, spatial, uh, spatial differentiation with temporal differentiation write this as minus epsilon dou by dou T of divergence of E. So, if you plug in the value of divergence of E from Gauss law this becomes minus rho by epsilon. So, this becomes minus dou rho by dou T and you get the equation of continuity namely divergence of J D divergence of J C plus dou rho by dou T is 0. So, in order to maintain the equation of continuity in time varying situations when the charge varies with time we require that is in non steady situations we need to add the Maxwell displacement current correction term and that is what makes it work. So, now we write these three equations, we write these three equations in component form. So, you get dou E z by dou y minus dou E y by dou z is equal to minus j omega mu h x. Similarly, dou E y by dou x minus dou E x by dou y is equal to minus j omega mu h y and similarly for the z component likewise for the h component and then you assume before analyzing a rectangular cavity antenna we analyze a rectangular waveguide for the simple reason that a waveguide is what it has got it has got in, it infinitely stretches stretches in, in, in to an infinite extent along the plus z and minus z directions and you do not have. So, for the field to propagate through the waveguide along the z direction you should have a dependence as different dependence of the field z component of the dependence of the field as being proportional to e power minus gamma z because gamma represents the propagation constant. If gamma has got a real part then it will correspond that will be attenuation of the waves. If gamma has a pure imaginary part then it will only be propagation of the waves and if gamma has both real and imaginary parts then it will attenuate as well as propagate. So, when we analyze the motion of fields along the z direction we get the waveguide equations and when we put a boundary condition actually it will turn out that gamma will satisfy an equation such that minus gamma also satisfies the same equation. So, the general so general dependence of the general dependence of the field along the z direction will be a linear combination of e power plus or minus gamma z and what linear combination you choose to satisfy the boundary condition at the on the z surface that is very important namely the since the z since this surface z equal to d and z equal to 0 they are also perfect conductors it will follow that the normal component of the magnetic field of B on this surface top surface is 0 and the tangential component of the electric field on this top surface and bottom surface they are also 0. That is when you apply the boundary condition to the z to the z surfaces that is to the surfaces x y equal to constant x z equal to constant namely the surfaces which are parallel to the x y plane then you get additional boundary conditions which are not present in the waveguide situation they are special characteristic they are a special characteristic of the of the resonator cavity antenna. So, first we will analyze the waveguide equations and then put the boundary condition and get the modes in a cavity resonator. So, what we do is we, up, we assume that E x E y E z and H x H y H z these are proportional to E power gamma z minus gamma z and these are proportional to E power minus gamma z. So, now write down the Maxwell equation for example, if you look at the curly equation dou E y by dou x dou E is dou E z by dou y minus dou E y by dou z is equal to minus j omega mu h x. Now, dou by dou z is replaced by multiplication by minus gamma because if you differentiate e power minus gamma z with respect to z you will get a multiplication factor of minus gamma. So, this becomes dou E z by dou y dou y plus gamma E y and that is minus j omega mu h x. Likewise, dou E x by dou z the second Maxwell curl equation the y component of the Maxwell curl equation for the electric field E dou E x by dou z minus dou E z by dou x is equal to minus j omega mu h y. Again you substitute instead of dou by dou z of E x you put minus gamma E x. So, it will become minus gamma E x minus dou E z by dou x dou x 
this is minus j omega mu h y. Like this, you get three, the other third equation. You can ignore the third equation, the z component of the Maxwell equations. So you get equations which are linear and algebraic in the variables e x h y and e y h x, and the source terms are dou e z by dou x, dou e z by dou y, dou e dou h z by dou x, and dou h z by dou y. That is, you can solve in principle. You can you have to solve only linear algebraic equations for expressing e x, e y, h x, and h y. Entirely in terms of linear combinations of uh, the transverse components of the electric of the longitudinal transverse derivatives, transverse gradient of the z component of the electric field and magnetic field, dou e z by dou y, dou h z by dou x, and dou h z by dou y. You can solve these equations. And I shall write down the solution. Sometimes, somehow, this particular equation I happen to remember very well because I have taught it numerable times in the class. I shall write down the final solution. You can verify this. You will get that E x is equal to, or you can write it in this form. You define E perpendicular, namely the x y components of the electric field vector to be E x into x hat plus E y into y hat. Likewise, you put h perpendicular as h x into x hat plus h y into y hat. Now, all these e x, e y, e h x, h y, they all depend on what? They depend on the frequency, they depend on x, they depend on y, and the z component dependence is e power minus gamma z. Likewise, for the magnetic field, omega x y, e power minus gamma z. So, when you uh, solve for e x, e y, there is another way, in fact, to write down the Maxwell curl equations entirely in the notation involving only E perpendicular and E z instead of separating out E perpendicular into an E x and an E y and separating out E h perpendicular into an h x and an h y. You can write the entire electric field vector as E z z cap plus E perpendicular. This is the longitudinal component. By longitudinal we mean z direction because the waveguide is directed along the z axis. Its axis is parallel to the z direction. And this is the transverse component. Similarly, you write h as h z, h z z cap plus h perpendicular. And the dependence of all these terms, all these E z longitudinal components of the electric field of the magnetic field, transverse component of the electric field and magnetic field, they all have a dependence as on uh, dependence with respect to z as E power minus gamma z. So you can also split the gradient operator. The gradient operator is x cap dou by dou x plus y cap dou by dou y plus z cap dou by dou z. And x cap dou by dou x plus y cap dou by dou y, this sum of these two terms, that, this, that constitutes the transverse gradient operator. So you can write it as del perpendicular plus z cap dou by dou z. Now when you have an equation of the form, say curl, curl of E, you want to write this equation in terms of transverse and longitudinal components. What do you do? Simply wrote that curl is given by del cross, del cross, which is equal to del perpendicular plus z cap dou by dou z cross. And cross, here you put E z for the electric field into z cap plus E perpendicular. And then you take the cross product, del perpendicular cross E z, z will give you del perpendicular E z cross z cap. Del perpendicular cross E perpendicular will give you a z component, right? Because both are parallel, both are transverse components. Del perpendicular cross E perpendicular will have only a longitudinal z component plus z cap times z cap cross z cap is 0. That won't give anything. But z cap cross this will give you something. It will give you plus z cap cross dou E perpendicular by dou z. And this you substitute into minus j omega mu h is h z z cap plus h perpendicular. So the perpendicular terms, you equate the longitudinal terms, del perpendicular cross E perpendicular is equal to, if you equate the z components on both sides, this is just a single scalar equation, you get minus j omega mu h z into z cap. So I can write this equality as z cap dot this, that is the z component. And likewise, if you look at the transverse component, del perpendicular e z cross z cap. Del perpendicular e z has got only x and y components. 
if you take the cross product of the x or y component with the z, z component you will again get an x or y component. So, again this is a transverse part. So, del perpendicular E z cross z cap plus z cap plus z cap cross dou E perpendicular by dou z. Now, this has got a E power minus gamma z dependence. So, you can write this you can replace this by minus gamma into uh, minus gamma into z cap cross E perpendicular because you can write dou E perpendicular by dou z as minus gamma E perpendicular. So, you can replace this by this and del perpendicular E z cross z cap minus gamma E z cap cross E perpendicular is equal to the tangential component on the right hand side or the transverse component on the right hand side it is minus j omega mu h perpendicular. So, like that you get two algebraic equations for E perpendicular and h perpendicular in terms of the transverse derivatives of the longitudinal component of the electric field. You do the same thing for the magnetic field you do you, you will get again the same thing curl of h is equal to minus is equal to j omega epsilon e split the same thing you will get del perpendicular h z cross z cap plus now curl can be written as what del perpendicular plus z cap dou by dou z cross cross here you are putting h z into z cap plus h perpendicular. So, here you will get plus z cap z cap cross dou h perpendicular by dou z is h z with a minus gamma with a minus gamma and that is equal to my del del cross h is j omega epsilon e. So, j omega epsilon you put the transverse component of this. So, again you get two equations. So, you get two algebraic equations for the components E perpendicular and H perpendicular, E perpendicular and H perpendicular in terms of del perpendicular E z and del perpendicular H z. Is it clear to everybody? So, you can solve these two algebraic equations and the final solution will be E perpendicular is minus gamma by H square del perpendicular E z minus j omega mu by H square del perpendicular H z cross z cap and likewise h perpendicular is equal to minus gamma by h square del perpendicular h z plus j omega epsilon by h square del perpendicular e z cross z cap right where h square is given by gamma square plus omega square epsilon mu omega square epsilon mu is nothing but the square of the wave vector of the total electromagnetic wave inside. So, uh, in fact how does this term arise you can see it very clearly if you look at the wave equation del square minus del square plus omega square epsilon you start with say del square minus 1 by c square dou square by dou t square acting on any wave function is 0. If you if the time dependence here is e power j omega t that is frequent at frequency omega then this equation becomes a three dimensional Helmholtz equation namely omega square by c square acting on psi is 0. Now, you know from Maxwell's theory that c is equal to 1 by root epsilon mu. So, you can also write this as del square plus omega square epsilon mu acting on psi is 0. So, this is the wave vector omega root epsilon mu is a wave vector omega root epsilon mu is omega by c which is the wave vector k and those del square is the three dimensional Laplacian. So, it is dou square by dou x square plus dou square by dou y square plus a dou square by dou z square and dou square by dou z square is replaced by gamma square because dou by dou z is replaced by multiplication by minus gamma because the waves are propagating along the z direction. So, this becomes plus gamma square plus omega square epsilon mu acting on psi is 0. This is what happens to the wave equation for waves propagating along the z direction and gamma square epsilon mu omega square epsilon mu turns out to be that h square. So, finally, it is h square which dictates the nature of the transverse modes that you have within the wave guide. So, finally, what you get is that del square del perpendicular square where del perpendicular square is 
dou square by dou x square plus dou square by dou y square, the transverse Laplacian operator. So, there is perpendicular square plus h square acting on e z x y h z x y, this is equal to 0. This is the equation for the fundamental equation of a rectangular dielectric resonator, not antenna, rectangular waveguide, rectangular dielectric waveguide. It will become a resonator once we cover the top surface with a conducting perfect conductor and cover the bottom surface with another perfect conductor. So, here you have the Helmholtz equation. Now, you apply the condition, the waveguide extends along the z axis. This is x, this is y and this is z. So, you do the separation of variables, you write the for example, you want to solve del perpendicular square plus h square acting on psi x y, this is 0. So, you write psi x y as some a x times b y, separation of variables and substituted this into this equation. So, you will get a double dash of x divided by a x plus a x plus b double dash of y divided by b y plus h square, this is 0. In other words, a double dash of x by a x, a x equals minus b double dash of y by b y plus h square. The left hand side is only a function of x, while the right hand side is only a function of y. So, both sides must equal a constant, since x and y can vary arbitrarily within the cross section of, over the cross section of the waveguide. So, you call this constant as alpha square, minus alpha square. Then what are, what are the solutions? You get the equation as a double dash of x is minus alpha square a x, then b double dash of y is equal to minus beta square of b y, minus beta square multiplied by v y in such a way that you are beta square is equal to minus beta square is minus alpha square oh sorry beta square is minus alpha square. If you take this to this side, this becomes minus h square. So, this becomes uh, this becomes you remove the minus sign this becomes plus sign. So, alpha square plus h square and this must be minus beta square. Just see carefully what we are doing. You get a double dash x by a x plus b double dash of y by b y plus h square is 0 and you are putting a double dash by a as minus alpha square. So, this becomes h square minus alpha square plus b double dash of y by b is 0 or b double dash by v is alpha square minus h square which must be minus beta square or equivalently alpha square plus beta square must be h square. So, this is the condition which the two modal eigenvalues should satisfy along the x direction and along the y direction. So, let us see what are the possible solutions. If you solve a double dash of x equal to minus alpha square a x, this is the familiar equation which we encounter when we read in mechanics the equation of motion of a harmonic oscillator in one dimension. You know it has got solutions as cos alpha x and sin alpha x linearly independent solutions. So, you can write the solution as you can write the solution as a x is equal to c 1 cos alpha x plus c 2 sin alpha x. Similarly, you can write the solution to b y as b y is some d 1 cos beta y plus d 2 sin beta y. Now, you are what you are you, suppose you are looking suppose you take your psi function as the e z function to start with. Psi can take psi has two possible values either it is e z or it is h z. We have been able to express by this analysis the transverse components of the electric field and magnetic field in terms of the longitudinal components. Everything the whole physics has to be reduced to only longitudinal components or the z component. So, if you put psi equal to e z x y, then you note that the tangential component of the electric field should vanish on the boundary because the boundary is a perfect conductor. You see if you take a perfect conductor, this space is a perfect conductor, then the tangential component of the electric field should vanish here. Why? Because within the conductor you cannot have any electric field. If you have any electric field in the static situation, in an equilibrium situation, then what is the meaning of a perfect conductor? By definition a perfect conductor has perfectly mobile charges, electrons and these electrons, any small electric field will cause these electrons to move rapidly and accumulate on one side 
until they generate a reaction electric field opposite in direction equal and opposite in direction to the applied electric field so that equilibrium is maintained so that the charges do not move and in this equilibrium situation there cannot be net any net electric field within the conductor. If you apply an electric field for example in this direction all negative charges will come here it will pull all the positive charges here it will push all the negative charges here until a reaction electric field will be generated in the opposite direction which will cancel out the direction of application of the electric field and the net electric field within an electric within a conductor must be 0. Similarly, the net magnetic field within an perfect conductor must be 0 because there is no electric field means there is no magnetic field if you apply Faraday's law of induction del cross E is equal to minus dou B by dou T if E is 0 everywhere then dou B by dou T is 0. So, B must be a constant B cannot vary with time B must be a function of x and x and y alone x y and z alone, but such an inhomogeneous magnetic field what will happen you see if you apply use the other Maxwell equation curl of h curl of h curl of h is equal to uh, dou E by dou T within the conductor there is no you do not apply any extra current. So, if dou E by if E is 0 dou E by dou T be, will be 0. So, curl of h is also 0 that is one way to see things if you take at a definite frequency dou B by dou T gets replaced by multiplication by j omega. So, j omega B becomes 0. So, B also becomes 0 at any frequency at all frequencies this is true. So, B must be 0 it can have only a DC component of the you can have a DC component of the magnetic field, but since we are dealing with the frequent with fields at a definite frequency omega this DC component must vanish is this clear. So, uh, you get this equation and you put alpha square. So, E z must vanish. So, the, we have seen that the transition component of the electric field is continuous and within the within the perfect conductor the electric field vanishes. So, the tangential component of the electric field outside that should also vanish by continuity of the electric field. Likewise, if you look at the magnetic field the tangential component of the magnetic field h tan 1 minus h tan 2 is equal to j s n cross this is the boundary condition for the magnetic field. How do you get this mag this condition you get that you look at curl of h curl of h is equal to j plus j omega epsilon e integrate over the surface. So, you get integrate over a line part of which passes on the top first surface and part of which goes within the surface of the conductor and the width of this loop becomes 0. So, you get the line integral of h around the loop is equal to integral j dot n ds j dot n ds or integral j uh, j dot j dot this vector ok. So, let us call this as j dot j dot this vector is the net current which flows through this that is the net current which flows through this loop. So, for example, for example, if you take let us say this is the x direction this is the negative x direction. So, here you have h x h 1 x here you have h 2 x. So, you are saying that the line integral of h around this loop gamma is equal to the line integral around this del cross h is j is the net net uh, net current through in this direction. If this is the x direction and uh, then the y direction goes here and this becomes the z direction this becomes the z direction. So, if you apply Stokes theorem to the Maxwell curl equation curl of h is equal to j where j consists of the conduction current the displacement current and the magnetization current all of them. Magnetization current you absorb within B. So, it would not come here conduction current and displacement current only you see if you take Maxwell's equations del cross B is equal to j conduction plus j displacement plus j magnetization is del cross m del cross h is del cross b is mu you put a mu you put a mu here. So, b by mu minus h minus the magnetization this you define as the vector h then del cross h becomes j which is j j c plus j d only these two components are left. So, if you take the line integral of h around this loop this will become minus h x into the length of the loop plus h x on, on the first side plus h x 2 into the length of the loop on this side and that is equal to 
here there is no contribution because this width is shrinking to 0. The width which separates the two lengths along the two sides of the surface. And then cross h is j. What is j? j is equal to if the surface current, surface current density is what? The current per unit length. Per unit length you have a js flowing along the y direction, along the mi minus y direction. You have a js flowing along the minus y direction. So, uh, if you calculate the current, it will be what? It will be j s times current per unit length. So, you multiply by the length j s l multiplied by this width. You would not take the width, current per unit length you are taking. So, j s into l. So, this is minus j s y into l. If the current flows along the y direction, it will contribute an amount the surface integral the surface integral of j s over this surface will be j s times l. The surface integral you are looking at j dot d s, where d s is d s is this surface and j dot this surface this can also be written as the surface current per unit length times this length. Because if you interpret your j s into delta as being j along the direction, j s per unit length multiplied by l is a total current, j is the current density. So, this is same as j multiplied by the surface area. So, you can conclude that j s must be equal to j times delta, but delta is shrinking to 0. So, the current density becomes infinite, but the surface current remains finite on a perfectly conducting surface. Okay. So, you get the equation that h x 1 minus h x 2 is equal to j s y. In general, you can derive this equation for the other components also. And what you will get is that the normal to this surface, if you take any surface, the unit normal to this surface from the second direction to the first direction, from the second direction to the one first direction, n cross h1 minus h2, that is a tangential component, but this is orthogonal to n. So, it represents the tangential components in some linear combination, and that is equal to js. So, the Maxwell boundary, the boundary conditions of Maxwell's equations. The boundary conditions of Maxwell's equations imply these are obtained, the, the boundary condition obtained from uh, Ampere's law with Maxwell's displacement current correction term in the Maxwell equation that leads to a, the following boundary, uh, boundary condition on the tangential component of the magnetic field, but the normal component of the magnetic field is continuous. So, if you apply this condition, in, in particular you see that Ez vanishes here, Ez vanishes here. E z vanishes here, E z vanishes here. And what is that E z? It is a combination of cos alpha x, C 1 cos alpha x plus C 2 sin alpha x and D 1 cos beta y plus D 2 sin beta y. Now, this must vanish when on this surface, this surface is y equal to 0. Okay. This surface is y equal to 0, this surface is y equal to b, this surface is x is equal to 0 and this surface is x is equal to a. So, if you put if you put x as 0, then cos alpha x becomes 1, sin alpha x becomes 0, this becomes c 1. So, c 1 must be 0. Likewise, if you put y equal to 0, then you should get d 1 as 0, if this is to vanish. So, you get d 1 equal to 0. If you put, so the electric field, tan, tra, the z component of the electric field has a dependence on x and y of the form sin alpha x sin beta y. Now, you put the boundary condition, apply the boundary condition that the that E z should vanish when x is equal to a and should also vanish when y equal to b. Then what do you get? You get sin alpha a must be 0 and you get sin beta b that must also be equal to 0. So, in other words you get alpha is equal to n pi by a and beta equal to m pi by b, where n and m are some integers n and m belong to the set of integers. So, what is h square then? h square was nothing but h m n square which is alpha square plus beta square that was the modal eigenvalue which was n square by a square plus m square by b square multiplied by pi square. So, what is the electric field now? E z of x y z is equal to of the, the the mode correspond the corresponding to the modal eigenvalue nm 
is given by a linear com the, the electric field is actually a linear combination of all these modes a linear combination of all these modes which can be written as some c n m times sin n pi x by a times sin m pi y by b times e power minus gamma m n z. What is gamma m n? You remember you have the equation omega square epsilon mu plus gamma m n square must be h m n square which is equal to m square by a square plus n square by b square multiplied by pi square. So, that implies that that implies that omega square epsilon mu plus gamma m n square is equal to h m n square which is m square by a square plus n square by b square multiplied by pi square. So, that gamma m n is equal to plus or minus square root of h m n square minus omega square epsilon mu which can be written as plus or minus j omega root epsilon mu times square root of 1 minus h m n square by omega square epsilon mu. So, obviously, gamma m n if you are going if this is positive if this has got a positive real part then you it can propagate only on the, along the z along the z direction you see you are looking at e power minus gamma m n z that is the dependence of the field on the z direction. So, if you write gamma m n if you write the real part and imaginary part of this as some alpha m n plus j beta m n then this becomes e power minus alpha m n z plus j beta m n z. So, if alpha m n is greater than 0 it attenuates along the z direction if you look along the z direction for waves propagating along the positive z direction alpha m n cannot be negative because that will imply a blowing up an infinite exponential blow up of the power which is not possible. So, you must take the negative solution the solution which has a negative real part here you must consider if it is propagating along the z direction then you must take the positive uh, sorry here you must take the positive real part of alpha m n if it propagates along the negative z direction you must take the negative real part negative uh, solution of this uh, of this quantity. So, uh, for a given for a given epsilon mu and a given m n you can ask which modes will propagate without attenuation obviously, without attenuation that can propagate only if this quantity is not imaginary 1 minus that is you must have the condition this 1 1 must be greater than h m n square by epsilon omega square epsilon mu otherwise you will have otherwise this quantity will become real which will be, be this will become imaginary and product of j and j one imaginary term and one another imaginary term is real. So, in other words what I am trying to say is that if h m n square is greater than omega square epsilon mu then this will this will be real and it will beta will be 0 which will correspond to exponential attenuation of the waves there would not be any propagation. So, waves will propagate only when h m n square is less than omega square epsilon mu for propagation that is the m nth mode will propagate m nth mode will propagate m nth mode propagates if and only if omega is greater than h m n by root epsilon mu. In other words omega is greater than omega c m n this is called the cutoff frequency of the m nth mode which is h m n divided by root epsilon mu which is equal to 1 by root epsilon mu m square pi square by a square plus n square pi square by b square over half. That means, the cutoff mode cutoff frequency for the m nth mode is given by pi by root epsilon mu times m square by a square plus n square by b square power half. So, that completes more or less the discussion of the rectangular wave guide you can do very interesting the problems with this further. For example, if you look at a gravitational field and you want to see the gravi effect of the gravitational field on electromagnetic waves, then you have to write down the covariant form of the Maxwell's equations. 
So you will take, you will write it down in tensor form f mu nu double dot nu is 0, where this becomes the covariant derivative. Or if you have a surface, if you have charge densities and current densities, you will write this as minus mu 0 into j mu, where j mu is the 4 current vector and f mu nu is the anti symmetric electromagnetic field tensor. The double dot nu is a covariant derivative in a, in a gravitational field, as we saw, as I mentioned earlier, general relativity tells you that the space time manifold is curved. So, ordinary differentiation of tensors does not lead to, does not lead to give tensors. You have to add a correction term. It is just like this, you take a curved surface, you take a vector here, if you displace it parallelly, it will pierce into the surface, it will, it will no longer live on this surface. So, you must translate it parallelly and then project it onto this tangent to the surface. And then you take the differential, the difference between the vector at the new point minus the trans parallelly translated vector. And the curvature of this surface, it depends on the metric of space time. So, that is why you get a covariant derivative. When you, when you, uh, when you, when you, when you want to write only tensor equations, all the equations of physics should be described in terms of tensor equations. Tensor equations, because tensors have the transformation, a transformation law, linear transformation law. So, that if an equation, if a tensor equation say t mu nu equal to 0 in one frame, then in another frame also it will hold good. If a tensor equation holds good in one reference frame, then in any other frame which is diffeomorphically related to the original frame, the tensor equation will again holds good. That is because you can write t bar mu nu bar as dou x mu bar by dou x mu into dou x bar nu bar by dou x nu t mu nu. The tensor equation, if t mu nu is 0 in this frame, then t mu nu bar will also be 0 in the second frame. So, all the laws of physics should be expressed as tensor equations. This was Einstein's great discovery when he uh, for, tried to formulate the general theory of relativity. It is called the principle of equivalence, which says that the, that the laws of physics, huh, that the laws of physics should hold good not just in reference frame which are inertially related, that is related through not only related through motion, relative motion being a constant velocity, relative motion of one frame to that being a constant velocity. It can be even accelerating, it, there can be a gravitational field. But Einstein's remarkable conclusion was that the gravitational field should be, should appear as a geometry of space time rather than as a force field in order to satisfy the principle of equivalence. Because so this covariant, so Maxwell equations are expressed in terms of covariant derivatives. And automatically, when you calculate the covariant derivative, the components of the metric tensor come into the picture, which tell you that electromagnetic fields interact with the gravitational field. Electromagnetic fields interact with gravitational fields. So, uh, and Einstein's weak principle of equivalence says that the loss of motion should hold good, the loss of mechanics should hold good in all reference frames. And strong principle of equivalence tells you that the loss of all the laws of physics should be valid in all reference frame, not only the loss of mechanics. And in order, to, in order to guarantee that, we must replace ordinary tensor equations uh, in special relative by covariant tensor equations. That is tensors equations where the ordinary partial derivatives with respect to the space time coordinates, they are replaced by covariant derivatives because only then you will get a tensor transformation law. For example, if t mu nu is a, ten, if t mu nu is a tensor, then t mu double dot nu will be a vector. Okay? This will be a vector. It will have the vector transformation law. If you have for example, t mu 1, mu 2, etc., mu k, mu 1, mu 2, etc., mu k. Suppose this is a tensor, mu r, then its covariant derivative, t mu 1, mu 2, etc., mu k, mu r, mu 1, etc., mu r, double dot rho 1, double dot rho 2, double dot rho r, rho l. This will also be a tensor. What is a tensor? A tensor is a quantity which transforms like a tensor. What is the transformation of a tensor? It is something like this. It is a generalization of this. That means in one frame, if t mu nu is a tensor, in the next frame, it is an, it's a linear transformation applied to the tensor with a linear transformation depending only on the diffeomorphism. Whereas, if you, there are non tensors which also appear in general relativity, which are used to define co the covariant derivative, like the Christoffel tensor, Christoffel symbols. And the Christoffel symbols do not transform like tensors, they transform like affine tensors. Okay? So, they are, but the difference of two Christoffel symbols transforms like a tensor. So, that is why you get, in order that Maxwell equations hold good in all frames, you must replace them by covariant derivatives. Now, if you take the waveguide, you take the waveguide and place it close to a massive gravitating body, which is say, which has got a metric of say, 
uh, of the Schwarzschild metric or the Kerr metric of a rotating black hole or Schwarzschild metric of a spherical black hole. It has got one of these metrics. Then you write down the Maxwell Kerr equations. Again, you will get the fact that you will get the, the Kerr E and Kerr H equations. The Kerr E equation, like Kerr E is minus mu dou H by dou T and curl of H is equal to J plus epsilon dou E by dou T. These two Maxwell curl equations will not be as them as they are. The a metric tensor, ter tensor term will also creep into these equations. To calculate that, for example, you look at say F0 R root minus G comma R is 0. This replaces the Gauss divergence equation, namely divergence of D, divergence of divergence of E equal to 0 in the absence of any charges. So replaces the equation. If you look at the replacement of the equation, divergence of B equal to 0 is given by FRS root minus G comma S equal to 0, where RS takes values 1, 2 and 3 and the Einstein summation convention is adopted. That is we sum over the spatial indices. If you look at the equation for example, curl of uh, curl of E, curl of uh, curl of H is J plus epsilon dou E by dou T and divergence of E is equal to rho by epsilon. These two equations, they are replaced by uh, in the absence of charges it is true. If you uh, no, if you look at divergence of B equal to it is not replaced by this, this equation if, see, let, let us just see. Divergence of B is equal to 0. There are two Maxwell homogeneous, cur homogeneous equations, namely divergence of B is 0 and curl of E is equal to minus dou B by dou T. Faraday's law of induction and the no, no magnetic monopole condition are two homogeneous equations in which appear in the Maxwell equations and they are replaced by F mu nu comma sigma plus F nu sigma comma mu plus F sigma mu comma nu is 0, right. And they are automatically satisfied if you take F mu nu as being derived from a four vector potential, namely, namely dou mu a nu minus dou nu a mu. So this is a tensor equation. The other Maxwell equations, namely the inhomogeneous Maxwell equation involving sources, namely the Ampere's law with a source term and a displacement correction, displacement current correction term and Gauss law with charge density. These two get replaced by f mu nu double dot nu is equal to minus mu 0 j mu or equivalently you can write them as f mu nu root minus g comma nu is minus mu 0 j mu. So if you look at this Maxwell curl equation within the waveguide in the absence of j it will involve it will involve f r f r 0 root minus g comma 0 plus f r s root minus g comma s is equal to 0, there is no current inside. So this Maxwell curl equation gets replaced by this, whereas this Maxwell curl equation gets replaced by one of these equations, namely f 0 r comma s plus f r s comma 0 plus f s 0 comma r is 0. And obviously here you have a contravariant components of the field tensor coming, here you have a covariant, uh, covariant terms coming, it is not like this, not like the Maxwell's equations in flat space time for a metric which is in the absence of a gravitational field. So you have to relate this contravariant and covariant components through the metric tensor. That is you write fr0 as gr mu g0 nu f mu nu and similarly you write frs. So you write frs as gr nu gr mu gs nu f mu nu. So everything if you express in terms of covariant terms there will be a mixture coming and the metric tensor will come into the picture will get involved when you write down the equations, field equation. Okay, now I continue with my lecture. Um, before going to the dielectric resonator uh, antenna, I would just like to mention one thing that we had we had for the for a rectangular waveguide we have derived the formula for the mnth mode of the electric field as uh, given by sin m pi x by a sin n pi y by b into e power minus gamma m n z, where gamma m n is the propagation along the z direction. This guarantees that e z will be 0 when x is 0, e z will be 0 when x is 0 or a, that is at the two side walls of the waveguide and it will also be 0 when 
y equal to 0 or b at the other two side walls. So, this defines the electric field completely, the mth mode of the electric field. Similarly, you can do for the magnetic field. For the magnetic field, that will also satisfy Helmholtz equation, namely del perpendicular square plus h square hz is 0. It will also satisfy a two dimensional Helmholtz equation. Separation by variables will again give you a linear combination of cos alpha x, sin alpha x, and cos alpha y, cos alpha y, cos beta y, and sin beta y. A linear combination of such modes. When I say this into this, it means all four possible combinations are possible. This into this, this into this, this into this, and this into this. And alpha square plus beta square is constrained to be equal to h square. And h square is m square by a square plus n square by b square into pi square, where m and n are integers. So, um, in the case of the magnetic field, h z will not vanish on the boundary, because we have seen that the tangential component has a discontinuity equal to the surface current density. Tangential component of the magnetic field has a discontinuity equal to the surface current density. So, you must rather try to ensure, instead of ensuring taking the boundary condition on h z, you must on x is equal to, on the x is equal to 0 surface, it is the h x which should vanish, because the normal component of the of b vanishes on any uh, conducting surface. That is because you have the equation divergence of b 0, which means the integral of b, b dot and d s, the flux of b through any closed surface is 0. So, if you take a closed surface like this, the flux through of the magnetic field through this surface plus the flux of the magnetic field through this surface that should be 0. In a perfect conductor, there is no magnetic field here. So, b, b, the flux of the magnetic field through this top surface must be 0, which gives you the normal component of the magnetic field on this into delta s, where delta s is this surface area that is 0 or equivalently b n is 0, that is b dot n is 0. Since b is related to h by a linear relationship b equal to mu h, you have h dot n also equal to 0. So, it is the normal component of h which vanishes on a perfectly conducting surface. So, you here you have to use the condition that h x is equal to 0 when x is equal to 0 or a and h y equal to 0 when y equal to 0 or b. And how do you derive h x, h y from h z that we have already seen using the Maxwell curl equations we had got h perpendicular is equal to minus gamma by h square del perpendicular h z plus j omega epsilon by h square del perpendicular e z cross z cap. In fact, to go over from magnetic field to electric field, you have to only use the duality in Maxwell's equations. Maxwell's equations, Maxwell's equations are invariant, are invariant under e goes to h h goes to minus e, epsilon goes to mu and mu goes to epsilon. So, once we know the electric field, you know to we, once we know how to compute the transverse component of the electric field in terms of the z component of the electric transverse component of the electric field in terms of the z component of the electric field and magnetic field and their partial derivatives. Huh? Sir, look into the camera. Ah, look into the camera, yeah. Likewise, by the applying the duality transformation, you can get the transverse components of the magnetic field in the same way as a linear combination of the z components of the electric field and magnetic field. Specifically, we had E perpendicular equals minus gamma by h square del perpendicular to E z minus j omega mu by h square del perpendicular h z cross z cap. If you apply the duality transformation, E goes to h. So, E perpendicular will become h perpendicular minus gamma by h square, e, e goes to h. So, again you will get here del perpendicular h z. Now, ep, mu goes to epsilon. So, minus j omega epsilon, h is remaining the same because h square is omega square epsilon mu plus gamma square. And if epsilon goes to mu and mu goes to epsilon, this remains unchanged. So, h will not change. But what will happen is that here you have minus j omega epsilon by h square del perpendicular h z cross z cap, but h goes to minus e. So, the sign here will change. This will become del perpendicular e z cross z cap. It will be, it will be change the sign. So, again you can express h perpendicular in terms of h z and e, the partial derivatives of h z and e z with respect to the x and y coordinates, x and y variables. 
So if you do that, in particular what you will get is that hx, hx is equal to minus gamma by h square dou z by dou x plus j omega epsilon by h square. Now if you look at here the x component will be dou z by dou y, dou z by dou y into y cap cross z cap y cap cross z cap is x cap. So that is the correct equation for h. Now hx should vanish when x is 0, but ez already vanishes when x is 0. So dou ez by dou y will also vanish when x is 0. So this will vanish. So the condition on hx on the magnetic field becomes that dou hz by dou x should vanish when x is 0 or a. Likewise dou hz by dou y should vanish when y is 0 or b. But hx and hy are given by, as in this previous slide, they are given by linear combinations of cos alpha x, cos beta y, cos alpha x, sin beta y, sin alpha x, cos beta y, and sin alpha x, sin beta y. So you get the condition that hx is equal to 0 when x is 0 or a. That gives you dou hz by dou x is 0 when x is 0 or a. Likewise, hy is 0 when y is 0 or b, that gives you dou hz by dou y is 0 when y is 0 or b. But hx, so hz is expressible as a linear combination of cos alpha x, cos alpha x and sin alpha x multiplied by a near linear combination of cos beta y and sin beta y. You see if dou hz by dou x should vanish, then if you take the derivative of cos alpha x with respect to x, you get a minus alpha sin alpha x and cos alpha x. So the coefficient of cos of sin alpha x should become 0, right? If hz dou hz by dou x should be 0, you should have only cos alpha. Likewise for if dou hz by dou y is to be 0 and y is 0 or b, then sin beta y cannot occur because if you, if you differentiate sin beta y, you get cos beta y which is 1 when y is 0. Whereas if you dif differentiate cos beta y, you get sin beta y which vanishes when y is 0. In other words, hz must have the form uh, cos alpha x cos beta y, cos beta y e power minus gamma z. Now you apply the condition that dou hz by dou x should vanish even at x is equal to a and dou hz by dou y should vanish when y is b. If you differentiate hz with respect to y, with respect to x, you get sin alpha x. So sin alpha x should vanish when x is a. So this is 0. That means alpha is n pi by a, where n is an integer. Similarly, beta becomes m pi by b. So for hz you have the expansion. For hz you have the modal expansion, summation dmn, dmn cos m pi x by a cos n pi y by b. And the gamma n is not going to change because the modal eigenvalues are the same. E power minus gamma mn z summed over mn into of course e power j omega t. What was ez? What was the modal expansion of ez? It was summation c mn sin m pi x by a sin n pi y by b into exponential minus gamma mn z. It's a, it's a curious situation here. Only in the case of rectangular waveguide, both the hz and ez have the same modal eigenvalues. That is because you, you get a special form of the solution as in terms of cosines and sines. If you differentiate, you get the same thing. But in the case of a cylindrical waveguide, for example, the two modal eigenvalues will be different because hz satisfies Dirich, uh, the Helmholtz equation with Neumann boundary conditions. That is the normal derivative, normal component, normal derivative of hz. Um, derivative of hz along the normal direction is 0, whereas ez satisfies Helmholtz equation with the Dirichlet boundary condition, namely ez itself vanishes on the boundary. In general, the two boundary conditions give you two different types of eigenvalues. It is only in the case of the rectangular waveguide that the modal eigenvalue remains the same. What is the modal eigenvalue? It is equal to pi square into m square by a square plus n square by b square, right. Now if you have, you can have various situations. You have what is called the TE modes. TE means transverse electric. TM means transverse magnetic. In the TE mode, your EZ is 0. You do not have a longitudinal component. In the TM mode, your HZ is 0. You do not have a longitudinal component of the magnetic field. So TE, com so TE waves are obtained completely from HZ. 
whereas Tm waves are obtained completely from Ez. So, in the case of a Te wave, you will have E perpendicular is equal to minus j omega mu by h square del perpendicular hz cross z cap and you will have h perpendicular as you will have e perpendicular as del perpendicular hz you will, there will not be an ez term because ez vanishes for the te modes and for the tm modes you will have minus gamma by h square uh, sorry for the te modes you will again have minus gamma by h square del perpendicular hz everything is derived from hz alone it is just like the superposition principle in circuit theory you want to find out the response of a circuit to ez and hz you switch off hz so that you have a te mode and find out the response to ez then you switch off ez find out the response to hz and add the two you get a linear combination of te and tm modes you will get all possible modes likewise in the case of tm modes your ez is zero so you are e perpendicular becomes equal to uh, everything is de derived complete in terms of ez minus gamma by h square into del perpendicular ez and h perpendicular is uh, j omega epsilon by h square del perpendicular ez cross z cap. So, if you know ez you can calculate in principle if you know ez and hz in principle you can calculate all the components of the electric field and the magnetic field in a waveguide. Now, of course, these modes are also orthogonal with respect to the standard inner product on the on L2 of the cross section on the Hilbert space which is the L2 of the cross section. Now, uh, I should just mention something see the relationship of all this with quantum mechanics before I go into the rectangular uh, dielectric resonator antenna. So, how do you how do you relate all these things to quantum in quantum mechanics you have a you have two types of equations the Schrodinger equation. Schrodinger equation and the Dirac equation. Schrodinger equation is the non relativistic equation for, a, for an electron, whereas the Dirac equation is a relativistic wave equation for the electron. So, in the Schrodinger equation, you assume that energy is related to momentum by p square by 2 m plus a potential which depends only on, on x or on uh, let me say v, v depends only on r. Okay. And the conventional quantization of quantum of classical mechanics involves replacing p by minus i h cross del, where del is the gradient operator and h is Planck's constant. And of course, they satisfy the commutation relation, namely x i comma p j is equal to i h cross delta i j. In the Dirac equation, what happens is that it is a more accurate equation because you are taking relativity into account you start with the energy momentum relation here in the in the Schrodinger equation the energy momentum relation between relation between energy and momentum is given by this, but in re special relativity it is given by E square is equal to C square P square plus M square C power 4. So, we choose units so that C is equal to 1 and you get E square is equal to P square plus M square. So, what you get is that E square minus P x square minus p y square minus p z square minus m square is 0. So, you would get an equation wave equation of this form instead of the Schrodinger equation. Now, this equation has problems because in both the Schrodinger and e Dirac equation in, in quantum mechanics in general E should the energy operator is rho by dou t whereas, the momentum operator is minus i h cross del right. So, Schrodinger's equation in uh, and p become uh, so if you write Schrodinger's if you write down the equ the wave equation in non relativistic quantum mechanics you should have e minus p square by 2 m minus v acting on psi is 0. So, if you make the replacements these operator relations these operator replacements this becomes rho by rho t minus 1 by 2 m plus 1 by 2 m h square del square minus v acting on psi is 0 or i dou psi by dou t is the Hamiltonian acting on is the Hamiltonian acting on psi. So, i h cross dou psi by dou t is the Hamiltonian acting on psi where h is given by minus h square by 2 m del square plus v the Hamiltonian of the Schrodinger particle. But in quantum mechanics the wave equation should always be first order in time it cannot be second order or third order for the simple reason that evolution in time t 
followed by evolution in time s should represent evolution in time t plus s. That means you should have a relation a transformation law u t plus s should be equal to t t t s which means that t t must be equal to t t must be of the form e power minus i t h the evolution operator must be of this form. Of course, why cannot it be second order if it is second order then t t will have two terms for example, if it is second order it may have e power i t h into a first wave function plus e power minus i t h into a second wave function, but this will destroy unitarity of the evolution. This will destroy unitarity of the evolution and you require the wave function norm square to be preserved as evolution goes along with time. So, it must be first order whereas, if you use the Dirac equation if you use the if you go into special relativity you get a equation which is quadratic in time this becomes what it is called the Klein Gordon equation you get minus h square dou square by dou t square plus h square del square minus m square acting on psi is 0. This is called the Klein Gordon equation. This is not acceptable as an equation of quantum mechanics because it is second order in time, it will have two solutions one corresponding to forward time, another corresponding to backward time, and unitarity, will, unitarity of the evolution will be destroyed. So, conservation of probability will not hold good. Mod psi square represents the probability density function. So, that is broken. So, what you do here is what you do here is what Dirac did was of course, you can ask you can take the, you can ask the question suppose you start with the Klein Gordon equation namely dou square by dou t square of psi uh, minus del square psi plus m square psi 0 taking Planck's constant as 1 and c equal to 1. Then this is same as saying that dou square by dou t square is represented by the corresponds to the operator del square minus m square acting on psi or equality dou by dou t corresponds to root of del square minus m square formally acting on psi. So, you may replace this equation to get a first order equation as dou psi by dou t is equal to plus or minus square root of del square minus m square acting on psi. This is the first order equation in time, but you cannot give meaning to the square root of this operator. So, what Dirac said was okay, let us do the factorization you have to factorize this into linear factors minus p x square minus p y square minus p z square minus m square acting on psi equal to 0. You cannot factorize this out using normal complex numbers. So, Dirac suggested that we use anti commuting matrix plus alpha x p x plus alpha y p y plus alpha z p z plus beta m multiplied by e minus alpha x p x minus alpha y p y minus alpha z p z minus m acting on psi is 0 where the uh, where you 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 make you choose these matrices go you choose instead of taking alpha x alpha y alpha z beta as complex numbers which will not help us you see when you factorize say x square minus y, x square plus y square you can write it as x plus i y into x minus i y x minus i y when you go to 3 or when you go to a third three variables x square plus y square plus z square cannot be factored into linear into linear uh, as a product of linear combinations of x y and z. So, you have to if you use only complex numbers namely i 1 and i. So, you must use some matrices to do this factorization where you interpret the 1 as an identity matrix. So, if you choose alpha x alpha y alpha z and beta as 4 cross 4 matrices such that they anti commute with each other that is alpha x alpha y plus alpha y alpha x is 0 alpha y alpha z plus alpha z alpha x is 0 alpha x m plus beta alpha x is 0 all these anti commute and they have square equal to ident 1 identity that means if you take alpha x square equal to alpha y square equals alpha z square equals beta square equal to i and alpha x alpha y plus alpha y alpha x is 0 likewise for alpha x alpha z and alpha y alpha z and alpha x beta plus beta alpha x is 0 and likewise for the other components. Then you get a factorization of this Klein Gordon into linear parts and Dirac said let us choose one of these linear parts and replace this equation that the Klein Gordon operator acting on psi is 0 replace it by this operator acting on psi is 0. Then you get a linear equation. So, E minus alpha x p x minus alpha y p y minus alpha z p z minus beta m acting on psi is 0 where now Dirac showed that you can get this you can get the desired factorization by using ok Dirac showed that you can get this required factorization E minus alpha x p x 
minus alpha y p y minus alpha z p z minus beta m. You can get this factorization by choosing 4 cross 4 matrices for alpha x, alpha y, alpha z and beta. You can ensure that they anti commute and mutually anti commute and the squares are the identity. And you get a Dirac relativistic wave equation which you write in the form of E minus alpha dot p minus beta m acting on psi 0. When you want to look at the interaction, so this describes the sea of electrons and positrons. He showed that the, if you take for example the hydrogen atom potential, then you will get both positive and negative energy solution. The negative energy solutions correspond to positrons because it corresponds to removing out an electron from the sea of electrons and creating a positron. So, a negative energy electron is interpreted as a positive energy positron. And you can also obtain the same result by going using what happens in an electromagnetic field. In an electromagnetic field, P gets replaced by P plus E A, where minus E is the charge of the electron. That is because when you write the equations of motion in Hamiltonian form or in Lagrangian form, you, you, you can derive for example, in the classical case, the equation of motion of a charged particle as m into mass into its rate of change of velocity is equal to q times e plus v cross b. And this equation can be derived from a Lagrangian, from an action principle by taking minus m0 or half m v square at the kinetic energy minus q times the potential minus v dot a. This starter. If you take this as the Lagrangian, then you get the non-relativistic equations of motion. If you want the relativistic equations of motion, you should replace the kinetic energy by m0 c square root 1 minus v square by c square minus q times the potential minus v dot a. Okay, if you call this as L Lagrangian as a function of time, position and velocity. It depends on time because the potential can depend on time. V dot a becomes V dot a as a function of T and R. These also depend on time. So, if you define the momentum by dou L by dou V and apply the legendary transformation to get the Hamiltonian namely H s P dot V minus L, P dot V minus L, the Hamiltonian as this, then the Hamiltonian can be expressed as, you can show that the Hamiltonian, you can show that this Lagrangian gives rise to the correct equations of motion, namely the Lorentz equations of motion of the charged particle. And if you uh, want to express this in Hamiltonian form, you make the legendary transformation according to this, then H will come out to be P plus E a square by 2 m plus V minus E V for an electron. And you can write, you can alternately write the Hamiltonian equations of this system in classical mechanics as d r by d t is equal to dou h by dou p and d p by d t is equal to minus dou h by dou r. Hamiltonian equations and you will get the correct equations of motion. And in quantum mechanics we know according to Dirac that the equations of motion of quantum mechanics are obtained by just replacing uh, the position multiplication the position by multiplication with the position uh, position function that is uh, multiplication by q or multiplication by r and momentum by minus i h cross del r where del r is a gradient with respect to r and then acting on the wave function writing down Schrodinger's equation as i into dou psi by dou t is equal to h acting on psi where h is the Hamiltonian. So, uh, uh, if you write down, if you do the same thing for Dirac's equation, what do you get? You get that the Hamiltonian H is equal to alpha dot P plus E A plus beta M. You get this as the Hamiltonian and the four component Dirac equation becomes I d psi by dt of psi t becomes H acting on psi t, which you can solve. Now, in second quantization, we quantize the whole field. That is A becomes an operator field, psi becomes a Dirac field of electrons and positrons and then you, uh, you write down the Hamiltonian in the usual way as an integral, you write down the Hamiltonian of the entire second quantized field as say psi star, then Dirac Hamiltonian HD psi D3R, introduce creation and fermionic creation and annihilation operators or psi, that is you introduce a you uh, you take this Hamiltonian, you take this Hamiltonian and you uh, 
you actually, okay, how, what is the familiar quantization process? You solve Dirac's equation for the wave function and you express the solution as linear combinations of um, linear combinations of creation and annihilation operators, fermionic creation and annihilation operators. Likewise, you solve Maxwell equations and express the electromagnetic field as a linear combination of photon creation and annihilation operators. Substitute this into the Dirac Hamiltonian. What is the Dirac Hamiltonian? The Dirac Hamiltonian in the presence of interactions is this. So, the Dirac, the total energy of the electro uh, of the electromagnetic field interacting with of the po electron positron field interacting with the electromagnetic field is given by minus I h cross del plus E a plus E a plus beta m multiplied by psi d 3 r. This is the Hamiltonian of the Dirac field and psi has to be replaced by its representation, its, its solution, its uh, expansion in terms of fermionic creation and annihilation operators and A has to be replaced by. So, if you solve, for example, if you solve Dirac's wave equation, you will get the modal required modes, right. If you solve, for example, uh, the eigen, if you solve uh, I dou by dou t of psi is equal to H d psi, where H d is a Dirac Hamiltonian, you put uh, psi dependence as e per minus i e t being proportional to this, then you get h d acting on psi is equal to e psi. So, if you go over to the momentum domain in the absence of electric field and magnetic fields, then you will get for each value of the momentum. So, h d will become alpha dot p 3 momentum plus beta m acting on psi equal to e p. So, this becomes an eigenvalue problem and you have two eigenvalues for this equation namely e p is plus or minus square root of p square plus m square. So, for each p, for each value of the 3 momentum you get a solution, you get a mod, modal solution. Likewise, you do it for, so you can, you can express psi as, you can express the psi in the, in the position domain as, these are the modal solutions as linear combination of these wave functions and the linear combination coefficients you choose as fermionic creation and annihilation operators. So, you get the expansion and why do you choose it as fermionic creation and annihilation operator? For the simple reason that canonical quantization demands that the canonic, the Dirac field satisfies the canonical anti-commutation relation C A R. That means, if, if you take the Lagrangian of the Dirac field and call psi as the position field, position field and you look at dou L by dou dou T psi as a momentum field pi T, then these two should satisfy equal time anti-commutation relations. That means, you should have the anti-commutator of psi T of psi the lth component of L and the m component mth component of the momentum this anti commutator should be I times delta L m. If you put this condition then it automatically follow that these expansion coefficients will satisfy the canonical commuta anti commutation relations for the fermion for the fermionic creation and annihilation operators namely you will get a k comma a L dagger is equal to delta k L. B k comma B L dagger is delta k L, where A k are the Fermi are the electron annihilation operators, A k daggers are the electron creation operators, B k are the positron uh, creation of op annihilation operators and B k dagger are the positron annihilation operators, B k daggers are the positron creation operators. These anti commutation relations will hold good for these coefficients and you can express the energy of the Dirac field namely this integral as by plugging in the these exp modal expansions for psi. So, you will get the, the, the energy, the Hamiltonian of the quantized Dirac field is given by simply of something of the form an integral of the form A p sigma dagger A p sigma plus B p sigma dagger B p sigma into E of p d 3 p, where sigma takes values 1 and 2 that corresponds to the fact that the Dirac, Dirac uh, equation in the momentum domain has 4 linearly independent solutions, Dirac eigenvalue equation has 4 linearly independent solutions corresponding to the fact that it is a 4 by 4 eigenvalue problem for a 4 by 4 matrix. matrix. For the eigenvalue E p plus E p which is equal to root p square plus m square you have two modes, you have two eigenvectors and for the eigenvalue minus E p 
which is minus root p square plus m square. You have another two modes. So, sigma takes two values, one and two, or you can take plus half and minus half, and this gives you the Hamiltonian of the Dirac field. Okay. So, uh, likewise, if you look at the electro quantization of the electromagnetic field, what do you do there? You write down the Hamiltonian of the electromagnetic field. How do you do it? You derive Maxwell's equations from a Lagrangian, namely minus one by four f mu nu f mu nu, or equivalently from a Lagrangian given by half e square minus b square. You can derive Maxwell's equations from this action principle. Delta of this, the variation of this is zero in free space, and the presence of charge matter, it is delta integral uh, j mu a mu. That is you rho phi rho v minus j dot a d 4 x, where rho is the charge density, j is the current density. If you take the variational variation of this and set this equal to 0, you get Maxwell's equation. So, if you write this in covariant form of special relativity, in the covariant form of special relativity, then f mu nu is expressed in terms of the vector potential, namely dou mu a nu minus dou nu a mu in terms of the four vector potential and uh, if you and a mu also satisfies the wave equation in free space. So, the wave operator acting on a mu is 0. If you write the solutions to this equation with the Lorentz gauge condition being assumed only then it will satisfy the wave equation. Then you will get an expansion for the electromagnetic potentials in terms of bosonic creation and annihilation operators and you substitute and into the Hamiltonian. What is the Hamiltonian? The energy of the electromagnetic field is half of e square plus b square, b square d 3 x or equivalently you can write it as uh, e is where e is minus del v minus dou a by dou t that is the electric field and the magnetic field is del cross a. So, you can write it as a quadratic form in the potentials and you get the energy of the electromagnetic field as a, as a superposition of, as of a quadratic form of a quadratic form involving the photonic creation and annihilation operator just as you have for the Dirac field. Now, when the two interact with each other like when you look at a quantum antenna there you want to describe uh, the electromagnetic field produced by a resonator cavity uh, when the when you have a finite number of electrons and positrons filling the cavity. So, you must jointly solve the Dirac equation and the Maxwell equation get the wave functions or uh, rather what you must do is you must jointly you look at the you look at the Dirac equation, you look at the Dirac equation and you uh, uh, interacting with the electromagnetic field. So, you write it as uh, gamma mu or you write it as alpha dot p, alpha dot p plus beta m or plus e alpha dot a acting on psi is 0 or you write this as alpha dot minus i del plus beta m acting on psi is minus e alpha dot a acting on psi where a represents the electromagnetic field. Now, this is a quantum electromagnetic field it is built out of creation and annihilation operators of the photon. Likewise, if you write down the Maxwell's equations you get delta of a mu is equal to the current Dirac current which is e times psi dagger. Uh, alpha mu psi. Now, when you quantize everything a mu is represented into as a linear combination of photonic creation and annihilation operators, psi is represented as a linear combination of fermionic creation and annihilation operators and when you take the this is when there is no interaction, when interaction is present then you expand in a perturbation series you write a mu as a mu 0 plus a mu 1 plus so on. And similarly, you write psi the solution to the Dirac field as psi 0 plus psi 1 plus etcetera, where psi 0 and a mu 0 they satisfy the free field equations without interactions that is this term drops out this term drops out. A 1 and psi 1 will represent the solutions in powers of the electron, electron charge you can express you can assume that the this perturbation expansion is developed in powers of the electronic charge E square then E times this plus E square times this and you get all the perturb uh, perturbation, perturbation terms in this by solving the perturbed equations. So, once you have this perturbation expansion for example, suppose you have a mu 0 plus a mu 1 E times a mu 1 and you have psi 0 plus E psi 1. Then in this perturbed state you can calculate things like 
what is the average electromagnetic field fluctuation at a large distance. So, once you have the perturbation to the Dirac field, you can compute the perturbations to the Dirac current within the resonator cavity. And from this perturbation current by applying the retarded potential formula, you can compute the perturbation in the radiated electromagnetic fields and then compute the moments of this perturbed radiation field in any state, say in a coherent state. So, that is the whole philosophy of behind quantum antennas. You and you can also control the radiation pattern. For example, I introduce artificially a classical electromagnetic field into this picture, so that I get an additional term a classical psi into the Dirac equation and I solve this equation. Likewise, I can introduce a current into a classical current into the Maxwell equations and call it as plus J c J c mu. I control J c mu and A c these classical sources, so that uh, the electromagnetic field in the so that the perturbed current uh, so when calculated in terms of these classical perturbations is such that it is generating a given mo set of moments statistical moments in a coherent state of the field at any large distance you can control these parameters that is the whole logic behind quantum antennas. Let us come back to the syllabus now. So, we will look at what happens to a rectangular dielectric resonator cavity here you put a lead at z equal to d at z equal to 0, you put a lead here. So, what happens then? So, you write the solutions as E z m n, I look at the m nth mode. So, I have sin m pi x by a, sin n pi y by b, y by b into you, have, you can have two as I mentioned you can have two solutions e power gamma m n z into c 1 plus c 2 e power minus gamma m n z. That is because if you look at the wave equation satisfy it depends only on gamma square Helmholtz equation depends on gamma square. So, if gamma is a mode minus gamma is another mode. Similarly, H z you can write as cos m pi x by a cos n pi y by b then d 1 e power gamma m n z plus d 2 e power minus gamma m n z. Now, you require that E x and E y, E x and E y are 0 when z is 0 and d because the top and bottom surfaces are perfect conductors. You also require that h z is 0 when z is 0 and d. So, if you put the condition that h z is 0 when z is 0 and d only one combination will survive namely this must be of the form sin of some beta m n z, sin of some beta m n z where I have taken gamma m n I call as gamma m n as j beta m n. So, this will vanish when z is 0. If you take d 1 if you take c 1 if you take d 1 equal to 1 and d 2 equal to minus 1 then you get sin h if you take gamma m n as j beta m n you get sin. So, this will vanish when z is 0 and to get vanish to get a vanishing term when z is d this beta m n z this beta m n z should be of the form beta m n d should be of the form some p pi where p is some other integer. That means, you are this whole term should be replaced by sin pi p z by d, but then what will happen you are in trouble then the frequency has to change because what is your gamma m n? What is your gamma m n? It is j beta m n, but you have omega square epsilon mu plus gamma m n square that means minus beta m n square that must be h m n square right that must be h m n square and h m n square is m square pi square by a square plus n square pi square by b square. So, omega and, and beta m n is pi p by d. So, you will get a constraint on omega from this you will get that omega square epsilon mu can take only the values m square by a square plus n square by b square plus p square by d square into pi square where m n p are integers. So, it means the possible oscillation frequencies within a rectangular dielectric resonator antenna are quantized, they are discretized. You cannot get all frequencies of propagation. In a case of a rectangular waveguide, you have you can have any frequency. If the frequency is greater than the cutoff frequency, then that mode will propagate. If it is lesser, then it will attenuate, but nevertheless, you can have all possible frequencies. In the case of a rectangular dielectric resonator and re, res, resonator antenna, that is a, a cavity, a rectangular cavity 
you have to when you impose the additional boundary condition on the z equal to 0 and z equal to d surface it will follow that omega can take only discrete values namely omega m n p which is equal to pi by root epsilon mu into m square by a square plus n square by b square plus p square by d square power half where m and p are integers. This is the most characteristic feature of a resonator antenna of a cavity resonator antenna. Let us now look at what happens in the quantum context. Quantum context. You enclose electrons, positrons and photons within a box. So, you are solving Dirac's equation with the boundary condition that psi should vanish on the boundary, right. Then you will get for the if you solve Dirac's equation, you will get you have to solve alpha comma minus i del plus beta m acting on psi is equal to e psi. You have to solve this equation and you have to solve this with the boundary condition that psi vanishes on this surface. If you solve this, you will get psi t r in principle you will get psi t r. How do you solve this? You simply expand your psi t x y z as linear combinations of sin m pi x by a, sin n pi y by b, sin p pi z by d and you substitute that into Dirac this equation and derive algebraic equations for the coefficients of expansion. So, E will take only a set of quantized values which I call as E n and the modes I will call as un by a single variable I am labeling it where u n of r where by n I mean m n p the triplet of integers m n p. So, you can write the Dirac solution as in this box as summation C n C n u n r u n r e power minus i e n t e n t plus d n v n r e power i e n t e power i e n t where now C n and d n will become will be interpreted as fermionic uh, creation and annihilation operator. So, C n will be an electron annihilation operator, D n will be an, a positron creation operator. So, you get the wave function in terms of these operators, the wave field rather in terms of these operators. Then when you put an electromagnetic field interacting with this, what about the electromagnetic field when I solve within the box, I get the same expansion as that in a dielectric resonator antenna as a, in a dielectric cavity. So, I am able to get the vector potential, the vector potential as linear combination of those modes C, M and P into whatever I mentioned there. You see in the previous slide, okay, you get an expansion for this in terms of the modes. What are the modes? You have omega M and P as your possible frequencies. You also know the modes of, um, you also know the modes of the waveguide sin M pi X by A, sin N pi Y by B and then you put a sin P by Z by C, D, normalize it. So, call that as UMNP, that is UMNP for the electric case R, R means XYZ and you can also have, uh, you can also have uh, uh, of course, this into E power minus I, E power E power I omega MNPT, MNPT, okay. So, you take the real part of this, uh, since these are all real in any case, you do not have to worry about that. So, the transverse electric case you had this, when, of course you are putting the boundary condition that H z vanishes at 0 and d and E x E y vanish at 0 and d. So, you are able to get um, an expansion for H z and uh, you express this in this form and C m and P's will now be interpreted as boson. Likewise, you will have a, t since you are putting real part of this whole thing, you see whenever you describe a phasor, how do you write it? You write A t r as some real part of A r a tilde r into e power j omega t. So, you are taking the real part which amounts to taking another term which in operator theory means you are taking the Hermitian part of this. So, a c dagger term will also appear and the c m n p and c m n p dagger c m n p dagger terms will be interpreted as respectively photon annihilation and photon creation operators. c m n p will be a photon annihilation operator of mode m n p. It will annihilate a photon having mode value m n p and C m n p dagger will, uh, will create a photon having mode m n p and you substitute this into the equations for into the Maxwell equations Maxwell Dirac equations. What are the Maxwell Dirac equations? They are nothing but um, alpha comma minus i del 
plus beta m acting on psi is equal to minus e times uh, alpha comma a psi and you put a control classical field also alpha comma a classical psi and similarly you have the wave operator acting on a mu a mu okay, acting on a mu is equal to minus e psi dagger alpha mu psi plus j mu j mu classical. So, when you substitute for, for a psi the 0 the 0 thought you expand this as a perturbation series and take the psi 0 and a 0 as those solutions which I just described namely corresponding to m n p mode an expansion in terms of m n p modes using photon creation and annihilation operators for that mode and likewise expanding psi 0 in terms of the Dirac modes u m n p taking it uh, u with linear combinations given by c k and d k which are the electron creation operators, electron annihilation operators and photon creation operators. You start with the zeroth order solution and you build out the whole solution in terms of the zeroth order solution and you get what are the perturbations in the, uh, what are the perturbations in the Dirac field, what are the perturbations in the electromagnetic field and then you can calculate things like the far field radiation pattern. For example, if you get a, if you are able to expand psi up to a given order of correction, it will be expressed in terms of all the creation bosonic and fermionic creation and relation operators. So, you will get psi dagger alpha mu psi, this is j mu into E and then you take the value of this at t, t minus mod r minus r dash by c comma r dash divided by mod r minus r dash integral over the cavity. That will be the far field radiated vector potential after a scatter, let us call it a scattered, scattered potential, the potential radiated out, electromagnetic potential radiated out by the cavity and then you can look at the moments of this in any state, say in a coherent state I look at the moments of this say a mu 1, a, a mu 1 at t 1 r 1, r 1, a mu 2 at t 2 r 2 etcetera, a mu k at t k r k, comma phi. You calculate this moment, statistical moments of the electromagnetic radiation field and you can calculate the average pointing vector also all in the co in a coherent state and you can see when super directivity takes place how to control these fields so that the the given pa mo these moments they are as close as possible to a given set of moments or equivalently so that the power pattern has a certain form like that you can uh, you can solve those problems also okay so today we discussed the basic equations which describe uh, propagation of electromagnetic fields within a rectangular waveguide after applying the appropriate boundary conditions we got the modal expansions and we described what are transverse electric transverse magnetic uh, fields at a given for a given modal value mn. Then we also discussed the dielectric resonator cavity uh, by putting a closing the waveguide with a conducting surface on both the top and bottom what are the modal expansions for the electric field and magnetic field. We showed that the frequencies get quantized or discretized in the case of a cavity antenna, in the case of a uh, dielectric cavity, but they do not get quantized in the case of a waveguide. And then we described a little bit of quantum mechanics, what does, how to, what is the, what is, what are, what are the Schrodinger, what is the Schrodinger equation for an electron in an electromagnetic field, what is the Dirac equation for an electron in an electromagnetic field, how do you quantize the electric field and magnetic fields and the Dirac field and how do you describe particles say electrons and positrons within uh, dielectric resonator cavity and uh, how do you compute their far field, the statistics of the far field radiation patterns. So, what we discussed today it was just a introductory lecture. Now, we will come to next time we will come to some more advanced parts of this subject where I will indicate the detailed calculations involved in arriving at these things at these uh, at these conclusions. For example, we will talk about uh, what have and we will also talk about some extra things like when you have inhomogeneity in the permittivity and permeability then how using perturbation theory for differential equations you will calculate the change in the modes, how do the modes get shifted and then when these uh, uh, when these quantities get perturbed by random by random amounts say when the permittivity, permittivity gets permitted by gets perturbed by a random field and the permeability also gets permitted uh, uh, perturbed by a random field then what will be the statistics of the corresponding perturbations in the electric field and magnetic field. Then we will discuss some more aspects about a quantum antenna namely about, about a classical antenna and a quantum antenna built out of a dielectric resonator cavity. Like for example, what happens when there is a strong gravitational field in the present close to the cavity, 
then how does Maxwell's equation get, how do Maxwell's equations get perturbed by the metric tensor of curved space time and how to control this metric tensor so that you get a given radiation pattern. These are optimization problems. We will come to, I will give you a brief review of the general theory of relativity and also of quantum field theory and how this can be used to design more accurate antennas and uh, st study the statistics of the electric field and magnetic field both the classical and quantum electric field and magnetic field radiated at large distances in the presence of such gravitational perturbations. Then we will describe a little bit of gravitational radiation namely uh, what are gravitational waves in the general theory of relativity, how do you quantize gravitational waves, how do you build a quantum theory of gravity starting from a linearized Einstein field equations and take cubic and higher order interactions in the metric appearing in, in the Einstein Hilbert Lagrangian by uh, by substituting for the uh, linear by substituting uh, uh, by substituting for the metric tensor the unperturbed metric tensor expression in terms of the graviton creation and annihilation operators how do you express the hamiltonian in terms of the graviton creation and annihilation operators then how do you study the interactions between gravitons photons electrons and positrons so such things we'll discuss then at the end of the lecture i will give you uh, some idea about recent advances in string theory, how string theory has replaced quantum field theory as a successful theory of quantum gravity because string theory is able to show that conformal invariance of the action immediately leads to the inevitability of the, uh, of the Einstein field equations of gravitation. So if, if string theory is, if string theory is, if you have a consistent string field theory which is conformally invariant then Einstein's equations follow as a natural consequence of quantum of as quantization of the string namely using the propagator of the quantum string whereas string theory is not allowed in quantum theory due to renormalization problems sorry gravity is not allowed in conventional quantum theory due to renormalization problems gravity cannot be accommodated into a renormalizable quantum field theory whereas gravity appears as an inevitable consequence of string theory if you require, if you put the additional assumption that the string theory Lagra action is conformally invariant. We will discuss these issues in the coming lectures.